It's also f***ing complicated and tragic and life sucks. Just want to mention, I've never said the F word ever in my life before until just now. So. An NBC News investigation found that the Katy Independent School District is one of at least a dozen Texas districts that have removed books about race, gender, and sexual identity after a statewide surge of parent complaints. Why are we sexualizing our precious children? Record requests to nearly 100 Texas districts found that during the first four months of this school year, parents made at least 75 formal complaints, compared to only one filed during the same period last year. Mary Ellen Cusella has three kids in Katie's schools and helped organize moms on this issue. So what we're talking about is vulgarity that is inappropriate for any child. I, I don't care what your ideology is, and your, your child is, uh, is precious and needs to be guarded. More than half of the books that Katie has removed as a result of all of this have main characters who are LGBTQ. Are people supposed to believe that's just a coincidence? Um, no, I don't think so. I think they should read the books themselves. So I did. Hey guys, it's Jazz. Welcome to another video. For today's video, I'm gonna be talking about books that have been banned in Texas. More specifically, a lot of these books are under attack by school districts in Texas. So we've got like Katy ISD, Fort Bend ISD, and even Texas legislators have been going after these books. So Matt Krause, he is a representative in the Texas legislature, and he devised a list of over 800 books that are supposed to be under review to be banned in school districts in Texas. Texas really is leading the way for other conservative states to do similar things and pass similar legislation. Um, I know Florida is very comparable in their don't say gay bill and, the, and Texas has been going after trans kids and their parents and all of these things are related. So a little later in the video, we're gonna talk about why this is happening. Let's go ahead and get into all these books. One of the banned books Carolyn loves is George Johnson's memoir about their black queer childhood, which includes a brief passage about sexual abuse George experienced as a child. In January, Katie Schools declared it not appropriate for any level. They can remove our books, but they can't remove our stories. What do you make of the fact that people have used the words pornographic and vulgar? They don't want their students reading about queer people. My book is not uh, being put out there to excite students about sex. This is what boys like to do. At a November school board meeting, a Katie parent read from George's book. I didn't want to spend my money on this filth, and it's in our libraries. So the first book I want to talk about is All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. This book has been under attack so much. I saw this book come up in so many lists and it's a memoir manifesto about George's life being gay and black. It's a beautiful coming of age story. I obviously give this five stars and I think that this is one of the must reads on this list. It's just such an incredible book. It's about masculinity. It's about coming to terms with your sexuality. It's also about how to navigate being queer and being different in a community that tends to promote toxic masculinity. One of my favorite topics that this book talks about is the treatment of elders in our society. And I haven't seen a lot of that theme really explored in a lot of other literature. We have such a horrible relationship with aging in the US. And I think that, you know, part of that comes from you know, if people are afraid of aging, then they're going to buy more anti-aging products and it does encourage people to hate themselves as they age, which I think is terrible. We hate old people. We don't want to get older. We're constantly afraid of getting older. You know, people in their 20s are seen as old at times or feel old. And, you know, people in their 30s, well, don't even talk about them. Their lives are over. And it's like, that's such a toxic mentality to have because even if you're young now, guess what? Everyone ages. Everyone's going to get older. You're never going to be as young as you are this very second. You know, that's just, it's just a part of life. And the more that we demonize it, the worse it's gonna be for us down the line because you're really gonna hate yourself if that's really what you think of, of older people. You're gonna get to that age too and then you're gonna hate yourself and then what? Nobody, nobody wins in this situation. You made people feel bad about their age. Now you feel bad about your age and it's a never ending cycle of despair. So let's break out of that. I think we need a lot more books that talk about the joys of getting older, the joys of being old. I want to see elders be romanticized and the life of an elder to be romanticized because I think that's something that we need. I'm tired of being afraid of getting older. 
it's fine. It happens to everyone and it's just a reality of life. But that's one of the things that I really loved about this book that I didn't necessarily expect was going to be in this book. It touches on that cycle of someone took care of me when I was young and now I take care of you when you're old. And even though George has a really great community around him and not incredibly homophobic and horrifying, you know, he still feels isolated for being different. And so even if you have a strong community around you and you're queer, you can still feel isolated. So it's it's important to have stories like this to help kids feel less isolated, especially now in this political climate, like growing up queer and knowing that legislators literally don't want you to exist, like that's not a good feeling. That like sentiment does trickle down. It is in everyday life in some places. This is a trigger warning part of this video. So I think that one of the reasons that this book is under attack so much and they call it even pornographic at times is because he does mention a time where he was sexually assaulted as a child. You know, this is a part of this man's life. Like, this happened to him. This is a reality that he has had to go through, that he has had to process. It is a reflection of the realities of life. And we can't guard kids from the reality of life. If anything, guarding kids and censoring books like this does nothing but endanger those kids because they're, they're not aware of what could happen. How are you supposed to know what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, if it's never talked about, if you're guarded from that? you won't know. You won't know if something is a toxic behavior or is abuse if you're not taught that, if you're not, if you don't know. Especially because, you know, sexual assault usually happens with somebody that you trust. So you might not know that it's even happening to you in that moment since you trust this person. By trying to ban this book, by trying to get this book off the shelves, like, you are trying to silence these people. And I think that's just incredibly wrong and is a reflection of our political climate today and what the goal of some of these legislators really is. And it's to erase the stories of queer people and people of color. For the boys, pussy or the idea of pussy or the idea of idea of pussy, a Mexican is a Mexican is a Mexican. Take her out back, we boys figured, then hand on the titties. Put it in her coin box, put it in her cornhole, grab a hold of that braid, rub that calico. You can find that on page 39 of the book called Out of Darkness, which you can find at Hudson Bend Middle School and Bee Cave Middle School. All right, not gonna lie, I had to Google cornhole because I have the game in the back of my yard. But according to Wikipedia, cornhole is a sexualist slang vulgarism for anus, the term came into the use in the 1910s of the United States as verb form to cornhole, which came into usage in the 1930s, means to have anal sex. I do not want my children to learn Thank about you. anal sex in middle school. I have never had anal sex. Thank I don't you. want to have anal sex. I don't want my kids Lord having anal Stone. sex. I want you to start focusing on education and not public Earth. health. I I don't even know how to respond to that. So this is this is the book Out of Darkness. It's by Ashley Hope Perez and this is the book that woman was just yelling about. And it's kind of sad that I have to say this, but no, this book doesn't have anything to do with anal sex, nor is it a how to guide for your children to have anal sex. Um Although maybe we kind of need that in Texas schools. Um, but no, this book, Out of Darkness, is a historical fiction book. It's set in the late, mid to late 1930s in East Texas. It kind of reads like a slice of life. It's about Naomi and her twin siblings. They move from San Antonio, Texas to a town in East Texas to live with their stepfather. It's a beautiful love story. It's an interracial love story in the midst of being in a small town in East Texas in the 1930s with all of the attitudes and politics of that time period. So it's certainly a really interesting read. It's really emotionally gripping. As the novel continues, it absolutely gets incredibly engaging, riveting, 
reading almost like a thriller at the very end. It was, it's a book that has a lot of layers and I wasn't really expecting that when I read this book. See how some of the things that are present, some of the attitudes that are present, even in the late 1930s, how they reflect onto the present day. That's really one of the most interesting parts about this book and why it's so powerful. So one of the topics that this book touches on is of course segregation in the late 1930s in Texas schools. In this book, when the family's living in San Antonio, they go to a Mexican school. So they had their own school that was for Mexicans. Once they go to the East Texas school, the main character, Naomi, goes to a white school and she's very nervous when she's going to school because she's not white and she should be going to a Mexican school, but there isn't a Mexican school there. And so you kind of see what her experiences are really like. I grew up going to Texas public schools and a lot of these schools have a gifted program and then they have a regular program. And so I'm talking about starting from middle school, you could really see a racial divide in these schools where black and Hispanic kids would be in the regular program and then the gifted program would be predominantly white kids. And you can see this racial divide already. Um, starting from middle school, you can see how the educational system is truly failing us and is segregating us from that young age. You can't tell whether a kid is going to be successful from what they're like when they're 11 years old. That's not what the job of the educational system is supposed to be. You're not supposed to choose what kids are good enough to succeed in life and what kids aren't. Can you imagine sitting there in a regular classroom and hearing that you're not a gifted child? Like no wonder these, no wonder these kids, if they don't succeed, no wonder they don't succeed. How is a kid supposed to succeed if you're telling them from a young age that they're not good enough? that they're not naturally gifted, that they're not naturally smart. But then to these gifted kids, you're telling them that they are better, that they deserve more, that they deserve all of the resources, that they deserve to learn and get good grades and that's what should be expected of them. And then the kids in the regular program, what's expected of them? Are they expected just to become workers? To not dream big? You also see the way that women are viewed and treated in their society at the time. And so that excerpt that the woman was reading from comes from a section of the book where the new student comes in and they're a girl and how quickly the boys start to sexualize her. And it really goes to show what the attitude around women presumably was during that time and it kind of adds to the historical context of the novel. Something that this woman is for some reason unable to comprehend even though this book is written at like a middle school high school level. So I don't know I think it says a little bit more about her reading skills than it really does about the book itself. And then one of the more one of the most powerful things in this book is the role that blame really plays in their society. We we've grown up thinking like oh, if someone can't get a job, it's because of immigration, because minorities are taking those jobs. Instead of assigning the blame onto where it should be assigned, why aren't there enough jobs? Well, maybe that has to do with the system, maybe that has to do with you know technology improving or something else. It must be about immigration. If COVID is on the rise, it's because of the board, not because we're in a pandemic and because we're not following public health protocols, but it has to be because of what's happening at the border. So quickly do we assign blame to somebody else. You truly do see how someone blaming someone could very quickly turn into hatred, turn into racism, turn into sexism. And a lot of that blame in this book, you can see that it comes from this insecurity, not feeling like you're getting what you deserve. It comes from entitlement. And I think that that's a really important lesson for kids to learn. You know, a lot of times if somebody is feeling jealous or upset or they really hate someone and they're a kid and they don't know why, usually it's because maybe they're they're jealous of that other kid. Maybe that kid has more than them. Maybe that kid's making better grades than them. It's a really important basic lesson to learn because once you grow up and become an adult, um, you can see truly how much hatred comes out of feeling like you're entitled to something, but then you're not getting it. And so it's just very easy to start hating people that you think um, have, a, have it easier for some reason or 
are getting a leg up in society when you think that should be you instead. And that's a very important lesson and one of the characters in this book is is that to a T. And I think it's really important for kids to be able to look at that, read this book, and see the harsh realities of what it would have been like to live in East Texas at this time, and see how that society is reflected in our society today. It's not even that history is repeating itself, it's that we've never really gotten to the root of the issue in the first place, and that's why we're seeing reflections of this today. And it's the very same people who are calling for banning these books that also want to say that this doesn't exist anymore, that racism doesn't exist, that there isn't inherent inequality built into our system. Well, we saw it built into our system in the 1930s, and then we're seeing a reflection of it today. And let's be real, that's, that's a reason why this book is banned, and that's a reason why they're coming after stories like this. I give this book five stars because I think it's a great historical account of what the 1930s, late 1930s were like in East Texas. It's believable, the characters are really well done, and it's truly an emotionally gripping story. By the end of the book, you're so scared to continue to read and see what happens next. Reading this book is like feeling alcohol sting the back of your throat. It's warm and painful at the same time. So I really highly recommend this book and I'm so sorry to the author that she's had to deal with so much weird backlash that has nothing to do with her novel. Now, what out of darkness lacked in anal sex? This next book uh, certainly doesn't. Jack of Hearts and Other Parts by Lev A.C. Rosen. This book is about Jack. He is a 17 year old teenager. He's going to high school. He's unapologetically gay and a slut. So Jack starts writing for an alternative school newspaper and he writes a sex advice column. Since he's kind of known around school as being their neighborhood slut and getting around a lot, which is and isn't true according to Jack. And his life gets disrupted by a stalker who claims that they are absolutely in love with him, but he needs to tone down his lifestyle. This book was really funny. It was a really enjoyable book for me. I don't have it with me here because I read it as an ebook, um, so you can probably find the cover over here. This book is similar to the show Sex Education if you've ever seen it. I think it's really great and appropriate for it to be in a high school library because it does talk about a lot of questions that high schoolers have about sex, about first whether it's their first time having sex or it's them coming to terms with their sexuality or <laughs> hey Persephone she's so cute or whether they want to have sex at all so the book is really interesting in that it has a lot of Jack's advice interspersed throughout the novel which I really like and I think is highly appropriate because how else are uh, Texas teens supposed to learn about sex when we're only taught in abstinence only education um, which does nothing for anyone because if teens want to have sex, they will, whether or not your whether or not their parents know about it or not. Um, and if they're not given access to good information about how to have safe sex, then that's gonna increase teenage pregnancy and it's gonna increase the rates of STIs. So I'm glad that there's a book out here that high schoolers can read that does give them some of this advice. One of the things that I really did like about this book was that it kind of talks about how overly sexualized the LGBT community is, particularly gay men. Gay men are hypersexualized in our society. I mean, look at what's happening in like the political climate in the in the US and in Texas. There's so much talk of, you know, grooming kids, grooming because what they're talking about is is not grooming um at all so there's a lot of talk about grooming about over sexualizing their kids um and it all has to do with the lgbtq community like i've i've heard some like outrageous things from conservatives things like the rainbow flag is colorful because it's to attract children like it's absolutely deranged to think that
this idea isn't new. This has been a conservative conservative talking point for a really long time. It before it was, you know, be careful. You don't want to be on your own outside and befriend a man and find out that he's a homosexual. Oh no. It's like, you know, it's that sort of like fear-mongering that was present before the legalization of gay marriage and it really is just demonizing a group of people to promote a theocratic agenda which is crazy because it's exactly what they say it they say like the gay agenda is the gay agenda is you know to leave them alone like leave me alone leave the lgbtq community alone people want to exist that is the gay agenda that is the lgbtq agenda leave us alone um and the conservative agenda is literally ban abortion ban the existence of trans kids ban even talking about gay people or sexuality in school their agenda is literally censorship and go back to traditional christian american american values that is their agenda what's really interesting in this book is that um, Jack gets hypersexualized by the girls at his school, the straight girls at his school. They they talk about him all the time. You know, he is like this enigmatic character who apparently has a lot of sex and is like super raunchy but that's not really true jack is extremely sex positive he does have sex maybe he has a little bit more sex than his classmates but it's certainly not to like the degree that these girls think that it is which i think is really interesting because that's what's happening right now is that the lgbt community especially gay men are being overly sexualized by straight people straight people are more obsessed with gay sex than gay people themselves. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> One of the ways that these conservative people talk about or want to talk about the LGBTQ community, especially gay men, is that they're constantly talking about how talking about sexuality sexualizes their kids. So talking about a non-straight sexual orientation is sexual, but then talking about a straight sexual orientation isn't sexual. It's this cognitive dis dissonance that just truly annoys me. Um, you can talk about sexuality without talking about sex. Like, wow, what a concept. There's literally events in school, like Valentine's Day events, and nobody thinks anything of it because talking about Valentine's Day even though you're talking about like love and like crushes that has nothing to do with sex like this is a concept that people understand Valentine's Day isn't about sex it's about love well sexuality is about who you're attracted to who you will love who you might like romantically it doesn't have to be about sex in fact, most of the time, most of the conversations that we're having, they're not about sex or they're not supposed to be about sex. You know, they're going after Disney because Disney wants to have more LGBTQ characters when what about like all of Disney's past of the princess getting saved by her prince charming and then they live happily ever after? Is that not is that not the straight agenda? pushing our kids, sexualizing our kids, forcing our kids to think of straight marriage all the time. Um, that somehow is, is not sexualization of children, but having an LGBTQ character in a Pixar movie is. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Anyways, Jack of Hearts and Other Parts. I gave that book three stars because it's not my personal taste, but I see how that book would be useful to have in a school library for kids to pick up and read a sex positive book. But I understand that that's also a terrifying concept to conservatives um, who have been pushing an abstinence only education on Texans forever. <laughs> Alrighty, the next book on our list is Darius the Great Deserves Better by Adib Koram. And this is actually the sequel to Darius the Great is Not Okay, which I loved so much. Um, that's also one of my favorite books now. Um, it's an incredible story, but this is the sequel. It follows Darius once again and his family. Now things have settled down. They're back from their trip to Iran and 
Darius now has an internship, he's on the soccer team, he's in his first relationship ever. This book talks about his experiences in high school, being in his first relationship, and all of the trials and tribulations that come with that. One of the things that this book deals with is the question of how do you know if you're ready to have sex for the first time? And I love that this book talks about that because a lot of books don't talk about what happens if you're not ready. I love that there's a young adult novel out there that tells teens that it's okay to not be ready. And so that's what's so funny about this being on the banned book list is that this book doesn't even have any sex in it at all. It literally doesn't. But of course, sex isn't necessarily what conservatives are trying to erase. Uh, they're trying to erase queer people. So this is a queer love story. It's honestly really, really cute. I love this family. It does touch on the racism that his family has to experience on a regular basis. A lot of us, myself included, have enough white privilege to be able to try and make ourselves more palatable to the white American norm. So I love that this book touches on that as well. I liked this book. I gave it four stars, but I did really, really enjoy this book. If you're a fan of the original, then I think you're gonna really love this. I just am in love with Darius as a character and with his family. And I honestly hope there's another book about Darius in the works because I just, I love this character so much. I relate to him. I relate to his inner monologue so much. So I'm just such a fan of the character and I would love to read anything else that this author puts out with Darius as the main character. The next book I want to talk about is Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe. I'm obsessed with this book so it goes without saying but I'll say it anyway. I'm gonna give this book five stars. I love this book so much. It's a story about two Mexican-American boys who fall in love and it's truly such a nice book. I think one of my favorite aspects of this book is how um, incredibly angry Ari is as a character because he's grown up in a culture that really promotes toxic masculinity. Being Mexican-American myself, there is a lot of toxic ma masculinity in Mexican-American culture. It really is there. The idea of being like a tough guy um, is something that is extremely present. So you see Ari kind of navigate through that and try and discover, you know, who he is, his sexuality, and how he can kind of reconcile these two incredibly different um, sides to him. Um, you know, one being like his lived experience, wanting to be this kind of tough guy who deals with all of his problems in a pretty violent way, you know, and then he finally meets somebody who isn't like that, who doesn't, who doesn't feel the need to do that. And he's almost trying to like reconcile that within himself as he discovers his sexuality. And so this, this book is, it's truly amazing. Um, I love it so much. I've talked about it before and the writing style in this book is right up my alley. I'm absolutely obsessed with it. It's such a beautiful story and I couldn't recommend this book enough. <laughs> Am I surprised that it's banned? No. Or that like they're coming after this book? No. Of course I'm not surprised. It's about Mexican Americans. They already want to get rid of those stories and it's about gay Mexican Americans. Well, of course they're going to throw the book out. If anyone's looking for an extremely beautiful love story, I highly recommend it. It's truly one of my favorites and I can't wait to reread it and read the sequel. <laughs> All right, the next book I have here, um, I have some thoughts about. This is The Nerdy and Dirty by B.T. Gottfried. They were the worst porn that you've ever seen. This book definitely has some smut in it. This book was fine. It was all right. I wasn't a big fan of it. I think I gave it two stars. Um, it's just not the kind of book that I would personally enjoy. That's really it. Um, not to say that, you know, it's bad if you enjoy this sort of book or that there's anything wrong with enjoying smut. I don't think that. It's just, it's not for me. Um, but this book is very sex positive. I think it's really interesting. It kind of talks about, it talks about some really interesting themes. It talks about the role that religion plays in both repressing sexual feelings and sexual urges. It also talks about like what to do in an abusive relationship situation, which I think is really important for kids to know about. Um, you know, as you grow up, like you're going to be in relationships with people, whether or not your parents know about it. And it's really important to know what to do if you're in an abusive relationship, if you're in a toxic relationship, 
what do you do? How do you navigate that? It's really important for kids to grow up knowing what to do or at least, you know, reading somebody else's experience or talking to somebody with a similar experiences because odds are they're not going to go to their parents if their parents even know that they're in a relationship. Um, so I think that's that sort of thing is really important to have in books and that's why censorship is, is wrong. Um, no matter whether or not you agree with, you know, how vulgar a book might be, it shouldn't matter. It's then don't read it how i would feel if my child came home with this type of book we cannot unread this type of content now this next book is my favorite on the texas band books list it's lawn boy by jonathan evison and this book is incredible it's a must read 100 percent is probably one of my favorite books of all time now because it's it's just that good so lawn boy is about michael he's 22 years old and he is trying to figure out what his place is in the world. It was really in a place in my life where I really really needed to read this book and I feel like it came to me at the perfect time. And so he is figuring out what he wants to do with his life and he feels so stuck, like he feels like he's stagnant. He comes from an incredibly low income family, he's very much working class and on the very poor side of the working class. I'm talking like poverty line, possibly below the poverty line. He lives on a reservation with his mom and with his special needs brother. And the characters are so well done in this book. They are, if you're working class at all or have come from a working class background, then you have 100% come in contact with and met the people, the characters in this novel. I felt like when I was reading this novel, I, I knew I could think of somebody who was just like one of the characters that that gets introduced in this novel. It's absolutely so well done. It's a story about self-discovery as Michael grows up and he doesn't know what he's gonna do in his life and he kind of looks around and he sees all of the poverty around him, all of the really hard work around him and he feels angry. He feels like he's been done dirty by the world, by the system. That sentiment is so absolutely alive in anyone who's working class, who has worked minimum wage jobs, who has worked service jobs, who has worked in manual labor. I can tell you that I felt exactly the way that Michael's felt in his past and you know I come from a, a working class family and I've been working a part-time job at least since I was 16 years old and not to say that I'm anywhere like near as poor as Michael is in this book but I have been adjacent to this to a certain level of poverty and the attitudes that people have about the working class and that they'll have about you. Obviously Michael doesn't want to live around poverty anymore so he's kind of trying out different jobs and and seeing like what sticks because it's really difficult for him to find a job because he's extremely poor he doesn't have the right look to go in a job interview he doesn't have the educational background he doesn't have you know the great interviewer skills you know they're asking him why he wants his job and he wants his job because of money and yeah, like, I mean, we all know that that's why we're going for that job, but we all know that we're not supposed to say that. Um, even though that's 100% the truth of why you're going for that job. And this book is extremely real. It keeps it real, which I love. I love the style that this book is written in. It's really easy to read. The language is powerful, and that's what I really appreciate about it. It's an extremely accessible book, and I love that. It doesn't have to rely on, like, crazy metaphors or, like, a lot of overly descriptive flowery language because it relies on the emotion that these characters have towards themselves, th towards one another, and towards the system that perpetuates their poverty, which I think is absolutely incredible and so refreshing to read. So one of the things that this book deals with is making ethical choices as Michael is trying to find what he's going to do in his life. You know, he comes across a lot of choices. Do I walk all over other people just so I can get a better job? Just so I can make some more money? If I go to a job and the people treat me as subhuman, should I keep working that job? I really need the money, but they're treating me like I'm not even a human being. It deals with that ethical question as well. Like how much am I willing to put up with in order to make some money? How much should I put up with? Is this even okay? Is it even okay for people to treat other human beings like this? Like it's not. And so for the first time, like I'm reading a book where these questions are being brought to light. 
It also does a really good job of highlighting the entitlement that these really rich people have towards you know what needs to be done towards their workers. Someone gets hired to mow the lawn and then suddenly they're doing 10 times more work because they're adding more and more responsibilities to their work without increasing their pay, which is something that I think happens at a lot of jobs, first of all, but when you're working in service, this happens as well. I know my mom used to be a babysitter for a more wealthy family, and she told me that, you know, they wanted her to babysit, and then they were asking her to also clean up around the house, and then they, you know, they even wanted her to start cooking, and she eventually had to leave because they weren't increasing her pay, even though they were expecting more and more and more from her. And it's this entitlement that these people feel towards their workers. They feel better than them. They feel like they're expected to be served. And that's just not the case. Just because you have money doesn't mean that other people should serve you. It's a job. You pay them for the job that you hired them for, and if you want more done, then you need to pay them more. One of the things that I love the most is that so many books are about the glamorous lives of the rich, of the elite, of the one percent. And even like in popular media, I'm kind of tired of seeing stories that are about royalty, that are about the upper class, that are about super rich and famous people. I'm kind of over it. I understand romanticizing that sort of lifestyle to an extent. It's fun escapism and there's nothing wrong with liking that and there's nothing wrong with you if you like that. But it's also, you know, these these are the stories that corporations are greenlighting because they want people, I, at least in my view, they want people to glamorize this rich this rich and famous lifestyle. They want people to aspire towards that. They, they want that to be the goal for everyone because then it keeps people from looking around in their own positions and being like, hey, there's a bunch of injustice going on here. Why am I not getting paid for adequate hours? Why hasn't the minimum wage been increased? For anybody wondering, the minimum wage in Texas is literally $7.25. That's kind of a huge problem considering how much inflation there's been, how much wages haven't increased, and how bad the housing market is right now. You know, in some ways I feel like these stories that are meant for escapism aren't always meant for escapism and maybe they're meant to distract people and keep people wishfully thinking that maybe one day they're also going to be rich and famous. And the problem with that is, is that the majority of people aren't. And finally, there's a book that isn't glamorizing that. Um, because a lot of people don't realize that a small group of people have 80% of the wealth. Wealth, what about the rest of the people? Did they really not work hard enough? How are you supposed to get a suit um, and do an interview if you're homeless? How are you supposed to apply for a job if you don't have an address? You know, there are barriers the poorer you get that stop you from climbing the socioeconomic ladder. And it's absolutely a fallacy of the modern day to say that it's doable for everyone because it's really not. It's a beautiful working class story, not a rags to riches story where the character goes from nothing and then gets rich and famous. And then it's like, yay, I'm so glad that they that, that happened to them. It's not that kind of rags to riches story. It's a rags to enough story. That's what I love about it, I think the most, is that finally there's a book that promotes having enough and being okay with enough and not just being okay with enough but being happy having enough enough being happy with what you have being happy being comfortable deriving your happiness from the people that you admire who are around you from the community that you've built that's around you deriving happiness from things from your hobbies from things that you enjoy doing with one another with sitting down at a meal and having people from all walks of life around you being happy with enough, not constantly chasing something, constantly feeling like there's someone who's better than you. With that, I highly recommend this book, Lawn Boys 100%, a must read. It's done amazingly, it's got amazing characters. I love the writing style and it's truly one of the best books I've ever read and I'm so grateful that I came across it now in my life. Um, so I highly recommend it. And the last book I'm going to talk about on this list is The Truth About Keeping Secrets by Savannah Brown. I really like this book. I picked it up honestly because I recognize the author's name. Savannah Brown is a YouTuber, has been making videos for a long time, and I've seen her spoken word poetry and I love that and I follow her on Instagram. I think she's super cool. Um, so I had to pick up this book anyway because it was written by her and I 
I guess wasn't super surprised to see this book on the banned book list because it is a queer love story. This time it is about two high school girls falling in love, which I love. I'm so glad that there's finally a lesbian love story in the mix here. Um, that's really nice. And honestly, if anyone has any recommendations for some lesbian love stories, I would love to read some. Um, but I really, really liked this book. Um, Savannah Brown is a really great writer. She has a, she really does have a way with words. I wouldn't say that it's as much of a thriller as the description might lead you to believe that it is, but it's certainly a really, really nice story. I love the dialogue between the two girls. I love the writing. The story is great, and it was just refreshing to read a book about two girls falling in love. I would recommend this book. I give it four stars just because I love the way that it's written, and I did really like the characters, and the storyline was really interesting, and I'm just a fan of Savannah Brown in general, so maybe I'm a little biased. I wanted to talk a little bit about why the censorship is happening, why these books are now being banned, since these books have been around for a really long time. So why is it now? What makes this moment so special? We saw what the books were. They weren't pornographic. They weren't overly sexualizing children. They were stories and they were stories about queer and people of color. But why silence these voices? A lot of these books were about queer people. They were about people in the LGBTQ community. And that by itself threatens this idea of the traditional white American family structure. It's interesting, like this censorship isn't even necessarily happening from the government in terms of the book bannings. The book bannings mostly seem to be coming from parents. So why are they suddenly so interested in banning these books since they've been around for a long time? Well, we've been seeing a lot of fear-mongering by the conservative media. Uh, we see Tucker Carlson talking on Fox News about these groomers. It's nothing new for conservatives to use LGBTQ people as a boogeyman to incite homophobia. Right now, they're using the LGBTQ community to try and fear-monger with parents. They're telling parents that their children's teachers, the student organizations that they're a part of, like the GSA, the media that they're watching, like Disney, is full of groomers and and people who are trying to over sexualize their children and people who are trying to influence them to become a part of the LGBTQ community and that's what conservatives are pushing right now in their media they're trying to use the community as a fear-mongering tool among parents and then these parents get all upset because they're being told by their conservative media that their kids are unsafe and so they go and they cause a big scene they go to these school board meetings and they get extremely riled up over supposedly sexual content when them themselves are the ones who are overly sexualizing the LGBTQ community and the politicians themselves who are in these conservative states that are pushing for all of this censorship, including Florida and their don't say gay bill or in Texas where Greg Abbott is trying to ban trans kids from even existing and trying to put CPS on their parents. Same conservative politicians that are yelling about grooming when it comes to the LGBTQ community are them themselves are also trying to push bills that lower the age of consent so actual grooming can occur. And if you guys noticed, a lot of these books that we talked about are intersectional. They were about people with more than one marginalized identity. And I think it goes along perfectly with why in Texas, and I think in other states, we have these anti-critical race theory bills. So critical race theory has the way that conservatives talk about it first of all, has never been taught in a K through 12 education. Um, I went to public school in Texas. We never learned about critical race theory. I did learn about critical race theory when I went to college and I minored in Mexican American studies. We did learn about critical race theory and we actually learned about our history. What does that do? I mean, now kids can't learn about their own history in school. Let's say you did have a social studies teacher who decided that they wanted to talk about, you know, the history of, of black people or Mexican Americans and the things that they had to face. And of course, when you hear that history, you're gonna get angry, you're gonna be upset, you're gonna want things to change but you can't be angry and you can't want change if you're kept in the dark. And that's what these conservatives are trying to do. Not only with their censorship and their supportive book banning, but with all of this legislation that is coming out. 
So I wanted to make this video because being from Texas, I thought it was important that I talk about these books, that I talk about the political climate that we're in. Being in one of the states that's leading conservative legislation right now, I thought it was important that we talk about it, have a discussion about it, and read some of the banned books and really see what's going on here. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know that this is a little bit different than some of the content that I have made in the past, but I hope that you guys enjoyed. I hope that you guys will pick up some of these books and let me know what you think in the comments. I want to have a nice discussion about it if we can. I know that these topics are super polarizing at times, um, but hopefully we can all have a nice positive discussion in the comments about it. Um, but anyways, with that being said, if you like this video, if you like me, if you want to see more of this kind of content, then give this video a thumbs up and please subscribe. And with that, I'll see you guys next time. Bye. And they took all of Giles' books away. He'll give most of them back. Moo just wants to weed out the offensive material. Everything else will be returned to Mr. Giles soon. If we're going to solve this, we need those books now. Sweetie, those books have no place in a public school library, especially now. Any student can waltz in there and get all sorts of ideas. Do you understand how that terrifies me?